Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. Welcome back. Hope you've had a good Lord's Day. Uh, it's our joy tonight to be back uh, together to worship the Lord for our evening service. We're very grateful for that. And tonight, as part of our Essentials series, it's our joy to discuss the topic of baptism, which I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you, uh, talking to you about tonight. And to do that, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3. Turn to Matthew chapter 3 with me. The title of our sermon this evening, The Basis for Baptism. The basis for baptism, our text, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. And as you know, this is a part of our Essentials series. We went through part one of the Essentials, dealing with those subjects essential to uh, the life, health, maturity, growth of a Christian. And now we turn to part two in our Essentials series on the doctrine of the church and the practice of the church. And so we come this evening to the subject of baptism. And we will look at the Lord's baptism, Matthew chapter 3, as a way to uh, discuss this subject together. So here's the word of God, Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, we're very grateful to you for your word, grateful to you for the gospels and how they depict the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And particularly grateful this evening, Lord, for this account of our Lord's baptism. Help us to understand from your word, retain, think about, meditate on uh, what's going on here with respect to the Lord's baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and as it's recorded in the other gospels and pray that we might draw from that uh, wisdom from your word with respect to our own baptism and help us Lord to um, see uh, wondrous things from your law and help us to understand this for our own edification Lord but for our worship and praise of you and uh, for love and gratitude in our hearts for what Jesus Christ has done for us. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of our sermon, The Basis for Baptism, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. So I have a question for you. What is baptism and why do we baptize? That is the question we'll be occupied with this evening. This group will not be surprised to find there are several disparate answers to that very important and very significant question. What is baptism and why do we baptize? Now, some would say <clears throat> that baptism is the means by which God literally washes away original sin. Or others might say that baptism is the means through which we are washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. And apart from performing the act of baptism, you cannot be saved. Right? Some say that baptism is the new covenant equivalent of old covenant circumcision. As some would say that baptism is merely or simply a symbol. It's just a memorial. It's just a picture, if you will, nothing more. Just a picture with little significance for the person being baptized other than being a performer of this ritual. And nothing more than that. Well, what is baptism and why do we baptize? That's the question we're asking. I've planned for us to answer those questions through a summary of baptism, followed by a biblical consideration of the significance of baptism. First a summary, and then its significance. All right, so let's begin with a summary. The London Baptist Confession of Faith, our confession, will get us started. Chapter 29, Article 1, where it reads, Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to be unto the party baptized a sign of his fellowship with him in his death and resurrection, of his being engrafted into him, of remission of sins, and of giving up into God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. Now notice first, our confession refers to baptism as an ordinance. 
something that the Lord has ordained for the church to obey, an ordinance. Now that word ordinance, often used in distinction to the Roman Catholic word sacrament or sacramentalism. Roman Catholics would mean by the use of the word sacrament that grace or favor is actually earned or merited through the performance of the sacrament, and therefore the sacrament then is absolutely necessary in order to receive that grace from God. It's a sacrament. We're talking of sacramentalism. So then, baptism, confirmation, the mass. If you grew up in Roman Catholicism, this is all familiar to you. Uh, confession, so on. All sacraments of the church. And quoting from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the church affirms that for believers, the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. That makes them sacraments, okay? And the question is whether or not salvation is merely symbolized in the sacraments or the ordinance of the, of the church, or is salvation given, brought about, originated, or sustained, or furthered by the sacrament itself? Is it merely symbolized in the sacrament, or is it bringing about salvation or bringing about that grace? Now, many sound Bible-believing Reformed Christians that are in our camp will also use the word sacrament. You'll hear them use the word sacrament. But in using the word sacrament, what they're not conveying, they're not conveying the same heretical meaning intended by groups like Roman Catholics, Lutherans, Churches of Christ, Anglicans, or others. But what they mean by use of the word sacrament is to convey that, that baptism is a means of grace. It's a means of grace. To the, it has benefits for the one who's being baptized. That's what they mean by the use of the word sacrament, okay? In other words, it's, it's more than simply reenacting a picture. Baptism isn't merely or only a symbol. It's more than simply a public profession. There is significance for the one who is a recipient of that ordinance, a recipient of baptism. Sam Waldron rightly notes that while baptism does not save, baptism does formalize salvation in a covenantal ceremony or transaction between God and the party baptized. Uh, he uses this illustration, which I think is, is helpful. Baptism is the body, so to speak, of which faith is the soul. It is a visible word of assurance. It's a visible word of confirmation, a seal of God's covenantal commitment given to the party baptized. More than just a picture, it's a means of grace, okay? So then, many Reformed Christians, using that word sacrament to describe baptism, have also referred to baptism as a sign or a seal of the covenant of grace. We refer to baptism as an ordinance, but it is an ordinance that is a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. And by means of grace, we mean that through a, a prayerful, faith-filled participation in baptism, that observance of that ordinance by the grace of God should have a confirming, assuring, establishing, edifying effect in the life of a believer. And those of you who have been baptized and have come to the waters of baptism in faith, I would probably give a hearty amen to that fact and that truth, that through it, uh, the Lord blessed you and established you and confirmed you in the faith. It has an edifying effect in the life of a believer. It is a means of grace and a very important means of grace. All right. Though not saving in any way whatsoever, God does intend benefit through baptism. And so then to avoid baptism or to neglect baptism, you avoid or neglect it to the harm of your own soul. Now our confession in speaking about baptism brings out three important facets of baptism that undergirds its significance. One our confession refers to baptism as a sign of our fellowship with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. In other words, baptism pictures our union with Jesus Christ in his own death and resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, verse 5, 
says this, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Our old man crucified with him at conversion, uh, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And baptism then becomes a picture in the likeness of that spiritual reality, right? Baptism is not effecting that spiritual reality. Baptism, a picture, is a sign baptism signifies that spiritual reality. It is in the likeness, so to speak, of the Lord Jesus Christ's own death and resurrection. Secondly, baptism, our confession states, is referred to as a sign of our being engrafted into him, brought into union with Jesus Christ. It's through that union that we have the forgiveness of sins, and baptism as a washing with water symbolizes this forgiveness of sins that we have through our union with Jesus Christ. It's a physical portrayal of a spiritual reality, okay? Third, baptism is referred to as a sign that in him we now live and walk in newness of life. We are a new creation. Baptism signifies the birth, so to speak, coming out of the water of a new creation. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So baptism then is a sign that communicates that the one being baptized is in union with Jesus Christ, is forgiven of all their sins, and is a new creation in Jesus Christ. That's the summary of our confession of faith on baptism. So, combine this then, that truth from the confession, with the New Testament teaching that baptism is also a response on the part of the believer to God. Now think with me, how is it that baptism is a response of the believer, on the part of the believer, to God? Well, it follows, first, follows repentance and faith. Baptism follows repentant faith. Peter describes it as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism saving us, Peter says there, not through any kind of mystical or magical cleansing power inherent in the water itself. In other words, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, Peter would say, but rather attributing significance to the appeal or answer that baptism is as a response of faith on the part of the one being baptized. The one being baptized is responding to God with an appeal for a good conscience through repentant faith, and baptism signifies that. So baptism, then, if you put that together, baptism signifies gospel realities imparted through our union with Jesus Christ, and baptism also signifies and embodies the response of faith in the one being baptized. Therefore, implications of that, to baptize someone who is not in union with Jesus Christ, to baptize someone who is not forgiven of their sin, to baptize someone who is not been blessed with receiving those gospel realities, to baptize someone who has given no such response to God of an appeal for a good conscience uh, through repentance and faith is not biblical new covenant baptism. It is empty, meaningless, heartless, even sacerdotal ritual that is sin against God. So the baptism then of infants would fall into that description, would fall into that category. The baptism of unbelievers would certainly fall into that category, into that description. It's not New Testament, New Covenant baptism. Now, that understanding, to get us started, that understanding is a summary. Uh, that summary of what baptism is under the New Covenant is built upon a biblical foundation of baptism's significance that comes to us from the Old Testament, right? It's reiterated for us uh, in the New Testament. So to begin our consideration of baptism's significance then, turn with me to the account of our Lord's baptism in Matthew chapter 3, the text read in your hearing, all right? Matthew chapter 3. Now, I want us to put on our thinking caps and work through this. Where does baptism come from and why, right? Where does baptism come from and why? Certainly, 
the baptism of followers of the Lord Jesus Christ should draw significance from the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, right? There is significance to the Lord's baptism that should impact how we understand our own baptism as followers of the Lord in the new covenant. Understanding the Lord's baptism should inform our understanding of our baptism into him, okay? Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist, the forerunner, is baptizing in the Jordan River. John 1 records that Jews from Jerusalem sent out priests and Levites to ask about John. What is he doing out there in the wilderness? What is he doing at the Jordan? Who are you and why do you baptize? If you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, what are you doing baptizing, right? John answered them, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know, it's going to be significant, and it is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. And John says in John 1 verse 31, I did not know him. They don't know him. John doesn't know him. But that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, John says, I came baptizing with water, right? So understand what John is saying. John is saying, so that Jesus Christ will be revealed to Israel, I've come baptizing with water. And through me baptizing with water in the Jordan, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, will be revealed to Israel, okay? The Jews do not know him. John does not know him. And the reason that John gives for baptizing in the wilderness is that he should be revealed. Two points of significance to consider. The first John gives the reason for baptizing that he should be revealed. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? In other words, John the Baptist is asking the same question that we're asking, isn't he? Why are you coming to me for baptism? What's the purpose of this? What's the purpose? Remember, John is in the Jordan baptizing people who are repenting of their sins, okay? Mark chapter 1, verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So John says to Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ comes to him, I need to be baptized by you. I'm the sinner here, right? Why would you come to me to be baptized for the remission of sins? The Son of God doesn't need to be, re to be baptized by me for the remission of sins. So in John, in, in John 1, John the Baptist then bore witness saying this, listen, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen, and I have testified, John says, that this is the Son of God. So John doesn't know who he is, but the one whom you see anointed is the one whom I have sent. He's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. This is the Son of God. In other words, his baptism in the Jordan was the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Messiah's revealing. So Jesus Christ gives another reason then for why he is coming for baptism. Follow along. First, it is his revealing. He's being revealed as the Messiah. Second, verse 15. But Jesus answered and said to John, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John allowed him. All right, how did John understand this? To fulfill all righteousness is the reason that Jesus gives. It's the second reason, the second point of significance we're going to consider in the Lord's baptism. Upon hearing this, to fulfill all righteousness, John consents and baptizes the Lord, right? What would that statement have meant to John the Baptist? Now, I heard growing up, when I was growing up in church, that baptism was a command for New Testament believers, right? The Bible commands that a believer uh, should go and be baptized. So I always heard growing up that Jesus, needing to obey all the commandments, 
would have to be baptized in the same way that we're baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness, right? It was sort of taking a, a more modern or a new covenant understanding of baptism and reading it back into that circumstance with John and the Lord Jesus Christ in the Jordan that day in Matthew chapter 3. We can't do that, right? What would John the Baptist have understood by the Lord's comments in Matthew chapter 3? What would he have understood Jesus to mean by fulfilling all righteousness? John had no concept yet of new covenant Christian baptism. We see that on the part of John, right, in the Gospels. John keeps having to ask questions is it you that we're looking for or should we look for another, right? He's, he's confused. John had no concept yet of Christian new covenant baptism. He simply knew that he was baptizing with water in the Jordan so that the Messiah, the son of God might be revealed to Israel. Now what John would have understood from the Lord's statement was obedience to the law. When the Lord Jesus Christ says, permit it so for now, that we might fulfill all righteousness, John would have understood that statement to mean we need to fulfill obedience to the law, the law of Moses in particular, right? Galatians chapter four, verse four. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. To redeem us, those who were born under the law, under a covenant of works, Jesus must be born under the law, and Jesus was obligated by the covenant of works to obey it all if he's going to redeem us, right? If he's going to redeem us, Jesus Christ himself would have had to obey all the law. So Jesus Christ intends to fulfill all righteousness. Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verse 25, the law says, then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Righteousness is perfect obedience to the law of God, right? But now Jesus doesn't merely use the word for obey here. He also uses the word to fulfill. Not simply to obey all the commands of the law, but to fulfill all righteousness. And we know that Jesus Christ fulfills the law not only by perfectly obeying the law, but also by revealing the law's true meaning or true intent, by being the one that the law or the ceremony points to. Jesus Christ fulfills that in the sense of becoming or being the one that the law or ceremony in the Old Testament points us to. So let me ask you, what Old Testament law could Jesus have been referring to? He's standing in the Jordan with John. Baptize me so that I might fulfill all righteousness. How would John have understood that? What Old Testament law was Jesus referring to? It certainly was not in fulfillment of the Old Testament law of circumcision. It wasn't that. Jesus was circumcised already. It certainly wasn't some kind of New Testament counterpart to that. There's no connection between baptism and circumcision, right? Where in the Old Testament law does baptism come from? It comes from baptism. <laughs> baptism under the new covenant comes from baptism under the old covenant. It comes from Old Testament law relating to baptism. And Old Testament baptism points us to Jesus Christ's baptism as a fulfillment of all those baptisms in the same way that we see types and shadows in the Old Testament fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the New. So, for example, Passover, the Old Testament Passover, we see fulfilled in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right? We see many types and shadows in the Old Covenant fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the New. Baptism in the same way. Baptism in the New Covenant... Baptism in the Old Testament points us forward to baptism in the New. Where does the Old Testament under the law require baptism? Turn with me to Numbers chapter 8. Numbers chapter 8. Now, there's some, there are some who would see Numbers chapter 8 as the basis 
for New Covenant or New Testament baptism. If you look at Numbers chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, listen to this passage. Numbers chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. <clears throat> then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them ceremonially. And notice first, it's ceremonial cleansing. It's not an actual spiritual cleansing taking place through this rite. It's ceremonial. And we know this to be true. Thus you shall do to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of purification on them. Let them shave all their body. Let them wash their clothes. And so make themselves clean. Now we have a few difficulties with this text right off the bat as it relates to New Testament baptism, right? The text calls for the sprinkling of water. That word is nazah in the, in the Hebrew. And some would say, I knew it. I knew we were supposed to sprinkle, right? Because Numbers chapter 8, the sprinkling, we're, so, we're supposed to sprinkle people in baptism. All those Presbyterians and Methodists have got it right and all of us Baptists are wrong, right? No, no. In the Old Testament, it uh, does frequently refer to baptism or some kind of baptism, some type of baptism as requiring nazah, sprinkling, right? There is a type of baptism that refers to here specifically sprinkling. Now, a vast majority of the time, that that word sprinkling is employed, it refers to the sprinkling of blood. A vast majority of time, it's the sprinkling of blood. And this is one kind of baptism in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 9. He shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. When did that sprinkling of blood take place, that baptism, if you will? It took place at the death of the sacrifice. When the sacrifice was killed, when the throat of the animal was cut, there was a sprinkling of blood at the death of the sacrifice, right? We'll make that connection in a moment. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. Isaiah, speaking of the suffering servant, says this, Behold... My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man. When did that take place? That take pl took place at his scourging before his death, right? His form marred more than the sons of men, and so he shall sprinkle many nations. When did that sprinkling take place? took place at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Through the shedding of his blood. It's one kind of baptism. It is a sprinkling of blood. If you remember the story of the soldier who pierced the side of the Lord Jesus Christ and out of his side flowed blood and water. In a couple of cases, in a couple of cases, that word is used of the sprinkling of water. Out of the numerous times that word is used, sprinkling of blood, a couple of times it refers to water, uh, as it is with the Levites, the Levites here in Numbers uh, chapter 8, verse 5. But it's always dealing with those who are unclean, and it always deals with purification, right? It also deals with unclean in Numbers 19. Listen to Numbers 19, verse 18. A clean person shall take hyssop, dip it in the water, Sprinkle it on the tent, on all the vessels, on the persons who were there, or on one who touched a bone, or the slain, or the dead, or a grave. The clean person shall sprinkle the unclean on the third day, and on the seventh day, and on the seventh day he shall purify himself, wash his clothes, bathe in water, and at evening he shall be clean. There's a necessity here. Numbers 19, for the unclean to be sprinkled by the clean to be made clean themselves, right? We'll make that connection in a moment also. Whether sprinkling by blood, sprinkling by water, both are meant to signify purification, right? They're to be purified. Now next, one, the problem is that this calls for a sprinkling of water. It's not really baptism, but a sprinkling, okay? Second, the next problem associated with this text with respect to New Covenant baptism, is that none of these circumstances in Numbers chapter 8 apply to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not a Levite. That's interesting to think about, isn't it? 
Jesus Christ was not a Levite. So this baptism of Levites in Numbers chapter 8 wouldn't have applied to Jesus Christ. It wouldn't have been why Jesus Christ was being baptized in the Jordan by John. And Jesus Christ was certainly not unclean. Uh, Jesus Christ was sinless, undefiled, without spot or blemish. So if Numbers chapter 8 doesn't fit the bill, then what other Old Testament baptism could Jesus Christ have been referring to? What is another kind of baptism from the Old Testament that could have been referring to the baptism of the Lord in the River Jordan in Matthew chapter 3, where Jesus, in fulfillment of the law, was being baptized to fulfill all righteousness? It would have been the baptism of the high priest. The high priest. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. And where does the Lord's baptism, Matthew chapter 3, what is the significance of his baptism in Matthew chapter 3? We find the significance for his baptism in the baptism of the high priest in Exodus chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. Right, in Exodus 29, we have the ordination ceremony. It was the consecration or the setting apart of the high priest for his office. In Exodus 28, verse 41, so you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them, set them apart, so that they may minister to me as priests. This was the setting apart or the consecration of a son of Aaron, so to speak, to serve as high priest. Verse 1. And this is what you shall do to them, to hallow them, for ministering to me as priests. Take one young bull, two rams without blemish, unleavened bread, unleavened cakes, mixed with oil, unleavened wafers, anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket, bring them in the basket with the bulls and the two rams. Verse four. And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. Now, the word there for wash is the word rahatz. It's the same word used of Bathsheba when she bathed on the rooftop. It's the same word used of Naaman the Syrian when he was told to bathe in the Jordan seven times. That word rahatz is referring to full immersion, a submersion under the water. This is not a sprinkling. This is a full body bathing, a full body immersion. Now, that becomes important later as we move from the wilderness and the tabernacle into the temple constructed by Solomon. Later, the bronze laver would be made for this very baptism. And the bronze laver was large. It was meant for full body immersion in water. Later, in 1 Kings chapter 7, Solomon constructs what he calls the sea for the temple. It's a very interesting name for that. This sea that stands before the sanctuary of God in the holy place, this sea that is meant for this purpose. It's for this baptism. There were ceremonies where the Levites and the priests would wash their hands and feet, and they would sometimes wash their hands and feet in the bronze laver or in the sea. But once per year on the Day of Atonement and at the consecration of the high priest, the bronze laver or the sea was used for a full body immersion to consecrate or to separate the high priest to his duty, priestly duties in the temple on behalf of God. They were to immerse themselves in this laver or in a later temple in the sea. And it was huge for this purpose. First Kings chapter seven, verse 23, the sea was 10 cubits across. A cubit, a good rule of thumb, is from your elbow to the tip of your finger. That's a cubit. The sea was 10 cubits across, five cubits high, 30 cubits in circumference. It was huge. I think someone said, I remember reading 10,000 gallons of water. Why would you have needed that much water to sprinkle? right? You wouldn't. This wasn't for sprinkling. This was for immersion, right? It was huge. It's interesting that before the throne in heaven, in Revelation, there is a glassy sea. There's a reason for this, right? There's a reason for this. Why the sea? 
is so important. And the pictures of baptism that we see in the Old Testament and how those pictures of baptism in the Old Testament relate to our baptism as believers under the new covenant, all coming together, full picture. Verse five, you shall take the garments Put the tunic on Aaron, the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate, and gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. Well, the very next step in the process of consecrating a son of Aaron to serve as priest was investiture. It was clothing them with the garments suitable to their sacred service in the temple of God, right? It was clothing or the garments, the trappings, if you will, that were suitable to their sacred service. Now, Paul makes a very interesting statement in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, where Paul says that as many of you as were baptized into Christ have what? Have put on Christ. Uh, we're given an investiture of Christ. When we are glorified and uh, at the end, we are given an investiture, aren't we, of a building, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We're invested with glory, as it were. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What happens at the new creation? We put on Christ. What happens when Christ returns at a consummated new creation? We, we receive an, an investiture of glory, a habitation made without hands, eternal in the heavens. Something to, something to think about. There is the account uh, many have made comment that when early believers in the, in the early church, when believers were baptized, that they were given new clothes when they came out of the water, uh, that, that those new clothes were an investiture of a uh, new life, a new creation, uh, something else to think about, right? Well, what should happen before you put on new clothes, so to speak, before the priests would put on those sacred garments of their service in the temple before God, in the sanctuary, what would they do? They would wash full body, full immersion. Jesus Christ tells Peter, John chapter 13, as he stoops to wash Peter's feet, right? Jesus tells them, if, you, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You know, wash all of me then, Lord, because I want all of you. And Jesus said to him, very interesting, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. When the high priest was immersed in baptism, what was only necessary for that priest after that was to wash his hands and feet. And once per year on the day of atonement before entering the holy of holies, he would wash fully full body immersion in the bronze laver or in the sea in the temple. Verse seven then, next step in the anointing or the consecration of the high priest to his office, verse 7, you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, put the hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. So you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve as priests, okay? Now, at the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan, what immediately happens when Jesus Christ comes up out of the water? What immediately happens? He's clothed with, he's anointed with the Spirit of God, right? He is the Christ, the anointed prophet, priest, and king. He's anointed with the Holy Spirit. That anointing to which all the Old Testament anointing with oil is meant to point forward to. You see, all of these Old Testament types and shadows pointing forward to that anointing of the Spirit of God, first of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then indwelling all of his, all of those who are his, right? Listen to Matthew chapter three, verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. There's so many Old Testament pictures here, right? The heavens opened uh, at the time of the flood. Uh, there was the dove and the olive branch, right? These pictures that are worth thinking about, meditating on. 
Well, when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, he came up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, when Jesus Christ began his ministry in Luke chapter four, what did the Lord do? He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, stood up to read, and he said, reading, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, quoting Isaiah chapter 61, right? Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant. He sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Are we starting to get the picture? Are we starting to put it together? What Jesus Christ is doing is he is fulfilling these Old Testament types and shadows, in particular, this baptism, this consecration of the high priest to his priestly duties in the temple, his priestly duties, as it were, in the sanctuary of God, serving God as high priest. Jesus Christ was baptized as our great high priest. Do you see? So then, in Exodus chapter 29, verse 4, the high priest was baptized at his consecration, his ordination as the high priest, and we see our great high priest consecrated to service as priest of the Most High God in Matthew chapter 3. That's the significance of the Lord's statement. To fulfill all righteousness meant to fulfill this picture of Jesus Christ as high priest. That's the revealing Right? Jesus Christ at the Jordan with the spirit of God anointing him is revealed to Israel as their great high priest, as our great high priest. He is the one who will perform that high priestly duty on behalf of God in service of his people. Christ will serve as our high priest, the minister for God as high priest. And that means that he must be baptized, that he must be washed that he must be anointed, right? But what about those other requirements necessary for a, the consecration of a high priest? There are several. What about those other requirements? Numbers chapter four, verse three, a priest was to be 30 years old and above, up to 50 years old. All who entered the work, the service to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting should be from age 30 to age 50. Well, how old was Jesus Christ when he began his ministry? He was 30 years old. He was 30 years old. Exodus chapter 28, verse one, the high priest is to be called by God. He couldn't assume the office for himself. He had to be called to the office. Hebrews chapter five, verse four, no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. And he's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ being called to that office. Well, in Numbers chapter three, verse 15, the high priest must be male. Jesus Christ is obviously male, aside from wacko feminists who might say otherwise in our day. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 21, verse 16, the high priest was to have been someone without defect. In other words, the high priest could not have been someone who was blind or lame with a marred face or limb with a broken bone, several other requirements. And Jesus Christ was without defect. He was a lamb without blemish and without spot. What about Exodus chapter 29 or Numbers chapter 25? The high priest was to be baptized or anointed by another priest. Hmm. Well, who was John the Baptist? Luke chapter 1 verse 5, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was a Levite, a descendant of Aaron. <laughs> Luke chapter 1 verse 5, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, served as priest. The division of Avijah, a descendant of Aaron. <laughs> so what does that make John the Baptist? It makes John the Baptist a Levitical priest, a descendant of Aaron, an office that he inherited from his father. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's why, that's why in Matthew chapter three, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent Levites and priests out to talk to John the Baptist at the Jordan, right? To ask John about what he was doing out there in the wilderness. They weren't questioning John the Baptist's authority to baptize. He was a Levite. 
They were wondering why he was doing it out in the wilderness and not in the temple and why he was baptizing Jews who were otherwise considered to be clean already. It was a baptism of repentance for the people to make their hearts ready for the coming of the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But as John the Baptist himself said, John chapter 1, verse 31, he came baptizing that he, the promised Messiah, might be revealed to Israel. John the Baptist was there at the Jordan to baptize Jesus Christ into his high priestly ministry. And this was the beginning of the Lord's high priestly ministry on behalf of God's people. In a similar fashion, fascinating confrontation with the Jewish leaders, uh, Jesus Christ takes up a whip of cords and cleanses the temple. Remember that story, that account from Matthew chapter 21? And he drives out the money changers, right? The chief priests, when the Lord Jesus Christ did that, he cleansed the temple, the chief priests come to him asking, by what authority are you doing these things? Cleansing the temple was a priestly duty. Cleansing the temple was a priestly duty. So they come to Jesus Christ asking, by what authority are you doing these things? And where does Jesus go with his answer? The baptism of John. <laughs> where was it from? from heaven or from men, right? Answer me this. If you answer me this, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things, the baptism of John, right? In other words, the baptism of John, uh, of Jesus Christ in the Jordan, is a high priestly baptism. Jesus Christ was ordained, consecrated to the position of high priest, baptized by, baptized by John, John in the Jordan, was it from heaven or from men? We know the answer to that question. It was the Lord's ordination into the priesthood. Now, wait a minute, we might ask. Exodus chapter 21, 28, verse 1, the high priest was also to be a descendant of Aaron. And Jesus Christ wasn't a descendant of Aaron. Jesus Christ wasn't a Levite. Jesus Christ was from the tribe of Judah. And that, that's the only qualification that appears to be altered for Jesus Christ in his role as high priest. And it only appears to be altered because that's why the author of Hebrews goes to such careful length to explain how the lineage and priesthood of Jesus Christ overrides and fulfills the priesthood of Aaron uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7. Jesus Christ is high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, long in existence before Aaron, and to whom Aaron paid tithes in the loins of Abraham. A greater than Levi, a greater than Aaron is here. So much more that could be said. Many other facets to this. The baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Jordan was his ordination and his consecration as our great high priest. So then what was the significance of that baptism for the priests in the Old Testament? Why was there a bronze laver outside the tabernacle? Why was there a great sea outside the holy place in the temple? Even a glassy sea that lies before the sanctuary of God in heaven. What was it that the, the priest was about to do when he was baptized there? He was about to enter the sanctuary of, of God the most holy place. He was about to draw near to the living God. He was consecrated, separated to God for God's service. And if he wasn't clean, he was dead, right? So he was about to go into the holy, the holiest of holies. Uh, he would have baptized, been baptized in the bronze laver in the sea. So our baptiz baptism then, what significance does that have for our own baptism? Christian baptism, at least in part, signifies through our union with Jesus Christ, that in him we are now made fit vessels to serve before God as priests. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Right? We are, it's the priesthood of the believer. We are consecrated as he was to serve, fit vessels consecrated to serve before God as priests. That's part of the significance of our own baptism when we come to the Lord in faith. 
Baptism is our ordination ceremony, if you will, into the priesthood of all believers. Baptism pictures our consecration to serve God as holy, sanctified priests who have access before his sanctuary by the blood of his son. And we worship and obey before him as priests. But is that picture of cleansing the only picture represented by the waters of baptism? Is that the only picture? Uh, Water isn't only a cleansing agent in the Old Testament. Water is also a picture of God's judgment. There are multiple pictures that are simultaneously communicated in our baptism under the new covenant. Our baptism. Um, Passing through the water is a picture of passing through the judgment of God against sin. You go into the water, it's picturing death. Coming out of the water to walk in newness of life, it's a picture of God's judgment. Going under the water is often a picture of drowning or perishing in the Bible. Passing through the water, often seen as an escape from God's judgment. Peter says that baptism corresponds to, or is a tupas, a type of the flood. Peter relates new covenant baptism to the flood. The flood is a type. Baptism is the antitupas or the antitype in 1 Peter chapter 3. One commentator said this, Peter uses a type to illustrate the way in which baptism separates the church from the world. Think about that. At that time, only eight people from the whole human race were saved. So now only a few from this blind generation, which is sunk in worldliness, will permit themselves to be saved. Our passage, however, relates the flood directly to baptism. Passing through the water of baptism is symbolic of passing through a water of judgment. That's true. We see that picture all over the Old Testament. Noah passed through the waters of God's judgment safe in the ark. The same flood that swept away the wicked uh, was Noah delivered from in the ark. Paul pictures the same reality in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He refers to Israel delivered from bondage and passing through the Red Sea as a baptism. And think about that. Israel passing through the Red Sea as a baptism. Israel rescued from the same waters that killed Pharaoh and his army, right? The Egyptians went into the water and the Egyptians never came out. Israel passed through on dry land. The Israelites delivered through the waters of judgment. So then going into the water becomes a symbol uh, signifying death and judgment. Coming out of the water signifying a resurrection, signifying deliverance. So baptism in a sense then typifies a judgment on the old man. Judgment on the old man who has died in Christ and the resurrection of a new creation, raised to walk in newness of life. So baptism then isn't merely or only representing a cleansing for priestly service, but also a cleansing from sin and a deliverance from death and wrath, the wrath of God. So baptism, the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan by John the Baptist is his consecration to serve as our high priest. But Jesus Christ also speaks of the baptism of his death, doesn't he? the baptism of his death. James and John come to Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and said, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand, the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus Christ said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, right? Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse verse 50, referring to his death, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. So death, judgment, wrath are also themes present in our New Testament theology of baptism. Resurrection after judgment. Now this is where, this is where Jesus Christ then fulfills that Old Testament rite of purification through sprinkling, the sprinkling of blood and water. Listen to this from Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 11. Jesus Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. He was consecrated as high priest, baptized by John in the river Jordan, right? Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, 
not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For the blood, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, there's a reference to Numbers chapter 8, Numbers chapter 19. If the sprinkling of the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, that's at Calvary, at the cross, how, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the in eternal inheritance. That sprinkling he fulfilled in his death at the cross, bearing the judgment of God for us. And that sprinkling pictured um, when the soldier pierced the side of the Lord Jesus Christ and blood and water flow out. And we are sprinkled by the blood, uh, but we go through the waters as it were. The only image that effectively, that appropriately portrays the spiritual reality of this is full immersion, right? Full immersion in death, so to speak, raised to walk in newness of life. So much more that could be said. You know what's um, particularly interesting about all this talk related to baptism? Absolutely no reference whatsoever to circumcision. <laughs> Have you noticed that? as long as we've been sitting here talking about baptism and the pictures of baptism from the Old Testament and the Lord Jesus Christ and the significance of baptism in the New Testament, absolutely no reference whatsoever, no connection whatsoever to circumcision from the Old Testament. New Testament baptism is not related to Old Testament circumcision. Baptism was a ceremony, if you will, that was used alongside circumcision in the Old Testament. They were alongside one another. A baptism would not replace circumcision as the sign of the new covenant. The circumcision of the flesh under the old covenant is directly related to spiritual circumcision of the heart under the new covenant. Uh, Moses, doesn't he say that he will circumcise your heart, the foreskin of your heart? regeneration. Baptism under the new covenant, however, is related to baptism under the old covenant, and we can easily see why. Jesus Christ didn't need that rescue, that redemption, that deliverance, or that cleansing for himself that's pictured in baptism. And so, Matthew chapter 3, verse 14, John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? Jesus answered and said to him, permit it, permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John allowed him. Why? Because Jesus Christ went through the flood of God's judgment for us. Jesus Christ went through the veil of death for us. Jesus Christ was consecrated as a faithful high priest for us. Why? So that we might have access to enter the holy of holies through him, in him, in union with him, dead to our old man, dead to sin, raised a new creation in him, consecrated as high priests, as priests to serve in the sanctuary of God, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, so that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Understanding the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan is the way to understand Christian baptism. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word and... Thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ was consecrated, our high priest. And he is our great high priest, our anointed prophet, priest, and king in his mediatorial office. So grateful, Lord, that he, even in the sprinkling of his own blood, has cleansed us from our sin. And we thank you, Lord, for in your infinite and amazing wisdom how all of these pictures come together in the new covenant ordinance of baptism, baptism signifying all of these absolutely amazing blessings and spiritual realities, the physical pointing to the spiritual, 
the physical, picturing the spiritual, uh, the spiritual being the substance, all those physical picture being the, the type or the shadow. So grateful to you for the reality that that picture signifies. And Lord, I pray that you would increase our understanding as we consider these things over time, that we'd understand from your word how this is uh, significant to our own baptism. And I pray, Lord, that we would honor you in it. Thank you, Lord, for this ordinance of the church, how it causes us to meditate on the person and work of our great high priest. And may you be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen.